Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I am your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I am joined by educator and performer Bruce Becker. Bruce, welcome to the show. Thank you, Bart. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm, first off, you're kind of a legend uh, in your own right, but we're talking about um, today, particularly, we're talking about uh, the great Freddie Gruber, who you took lessons with for, I think you said about seven and a half, eight ish years. Um, boy, Freddie is a legend. I got, you know, became aware of him, I think, in my, you know, when I was younger because of you hear about Neil Peart uh, taking lessons with someone and it blew everyone's mind. Um, but there's a lot more to Freddie than that. Um, yes, obviously. yes, absolutely. Yeah. But yeah, so. Um, why don't we, obviously let's talk about your lessons with him a little bit, but why don't we start? And, and of course, I think at some point we're going to hear about your amazing career as well, but why don't we talk a little bit about Freddie as a person? Cause I don't know much about him. I think it's a little bit, uh, elusive in a way of what's actually going on. And, um, so yeah, who is Freddie Gruber? That's a great question. Who was, and who is Freddie Gruber? You know, uh, Freddie being born in New York. And being around that period of time where jazz was the thing and uh, that ever-present art, as well as the growing nature of all that music, Freddie was around that. And he was around a lot of those great guys. You know, um, I have that classic photo of, of Freddie and Buddy. That was, I think, back in 1946. Uh, so Freddie would have been about 19 and they're sitting on the uh, back of a wooden chair, buddy with sticks, Freddie kind of hanging with his arms down and cross-legged looking a little cocky as <laughs> Freddie was. He was a very, let's say a very different kind of a guy as people who knew him would attest to his, um, uh, line that buddy rich gave him was you're none of a kind, you know, <laughs> not a one of a kind, but none of a kind. <laughs> wow. And so I think his youth. Uh, spent in uh, New York, uh, brought him a great deal of exposure to all that music, and uh, he was addicted. He wanted to play the drums. I know that one story was that his father was not on board with that. And um, he had basically left home, I think at 16, and uh, bumped into a pianist by the name of Joe Springer. And as I recall, the story as was laid out to me from Freddie, Joe Springer was a pianist who had played with a young Billy Holiday. And I guess he saw Freddie on a, a, a bench is the story. And again, it's hard to say, you know, Freddie had a, an imaginative uh, storytelling mode. Mm -hmm. But he said that uh, Joe saw him on the, a park bench somewhere and said, hey, kid, because he had drumsticks. Can you play those things? He said, yeah. He said, all right. So he kind of took him under his wing, I guess, for a little period of time. And uh, again, according to Freddie, he would get a chance to sit in with Billy Holiday at the end of the night and play some brushes on the bandstand with Joe. And so that's, you know, that's an early story. And if, I guess Freddie would have been about 16 or so. There's other stories where there was some, um, uh, I can't remember the name of the magazine, um, uh, but it was like a, a jazz rag. And the article was the shape of jazz or the shape of drums to come. Hmm. And that was an article about Freddie and they were talking about, Oh, keep an eye on Freddie. Now, let's wow. segue to a, another story about that period of time from Jimmy Chapin, who told me numerous times about how he saw Freddie play when he was a kid. And it's it's sort of a duality of story. He said, I never saw anybody play like that. It was very polyrhythmic. Freddie was ahead of his time. So that being said, the other side of what Jimmy would say, and, and, and again, this is Jimmy telling me, so I just want to put this out there, is Jimmy would tell me Freddie couldn't play four quarter notes in a row. <laughs> so it's hard to say as to what Freddie's background was in terms of those earlier days and, and how he uh, uh, was able to kind of get into the music scene if he was such a uh, progressive player, so to speak. You know, think about the times if you're in the mid 40s or whatever and, and late 40s, everything was just swinging and popping and jumping. So I would imagine that he had some of those sensibilities. But again, there's no documentation of exactly what he did. Uh, in terms of recordings. And, mm. you know, it was all left to my relationship with Freddie to hear the stories about where he'd come from. Yeah. And you, you got to be careful with that to some degree, which I'm sure most of it was true. But I mean, again, I grew up with my grandpa being a drummer and kind of getting me into it. And the stories, I feel like with older guys, there's a bit of a tall tales kind of um, 
thing where you need to take some of it. Yeah, I, I know what you're saying where it's like, I'm not 100% sure if this was exactly the Yeah, story. you know, well, by, okay, so, you know, and also my, my, uh, uh, my um, understanding and knowledge of that, my insight into Freddie would be basically vested into my relationship with him where I would be with him at a particular event. And when I heard the retelling of that event or story, I'd be sitting and scratching my head and go, wait a minute, that sounds vaguely familiar. And I go, wait a minute, that's not how that went down. <laughs> you know. So yeah. again, I, I don't know. But sure. I do know that, you know, Freddie had had allegedly had said that he hung with Philly Joe Jones in those period of times and they were practicing quite a bit. Uh, this was a time I think when Philly had lost his cabaret card that which he needed to be able to work in the clubs. And um you know, I guess at that time, just looking back at how he uh, assimilated things and was uh, putting together, you know, what became his educational process was based on all his activity of hanging with people and watching them. I must say he was a, he had a, a, an amazing ear. He was an amazing listener um, and he was able to really dial in to what was going on with people conceptually. So I think, you know, as he was there kind of not running in the right crowd, so to speak, because, you know, he was uh, basically getting into junk at that time. Yeah. I think that was the main reason he left New York was to get out of there and stay alive and be healthy, which, of course, that didn't really happen because when he moved to Los Angeles, he got kind of, again, involved in junk and uh, took him a while to get cleaned up as well. But yeah, um, that's, so, that's so yeah, so going back to like getting his whole educational thing together, I think, again, he was a masterful observer, um, communicator. Uh, let's just say he had a very cryptic way of putting out information. So <laughs> that was where I came in. I was really having to uh, take and pick his words and kind of get meaning to them because a lot of stuff that he would say was quite cryptic and it would take you, you know, maybe a, a year later, you go, oh, that's what he meant, you know? So now what year, uh, so tell everyone what year you started lessons, um, with Freddie. I started when I was about 18 in 1977. And so at that period of time, he was at the, I think what I look back and just from all my interactions, cause I was quite close with Freddie. I was on that, you know, innermost circle of Freddie's world. Uh, that was his greatest teaching point because he had this little house that he had lived in and he had it dialed in pretty well. And I say for Freddie because Freddie was notoriously late and he kind of ran on Freddie time. You could show up for a lesson at uh, four in the afternoon. There'd be like two or three guys backed up oh, and boy. you go, wait a minute. I thought I had a lesson at four. It's like, no, 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 no. Go, go run, run down to the, to the seafood broiler for me. And he'd have you do all these tasks, <laughs> you know, and he'd, he'd have very specific things. Like when you go to the bakery, man, Get me the rolls with the, the sesame seeds, not the poppy seeds, man. They get stuck in my teeth, you know, and then it would be a whole a whole thing. And if you didn't follow directions, my goodness, you got the riot act read to you. You wow. ne he never ever let you like off the hook on that stuff. So and then he'd give you he'd give you, you know, like let's say, just as an example, he'd go, It's four dollars and seventy-two cents. Bring me the change, and he'd give you a five dollar bill. You know, he'd know exactly <laughs> how much it costs and all those oh. little details. Wow. And so anyway, so my study started in 77 and I, I went fairly straight till about uh, 84. And in that time, I was um, kind of, you know, in this in this stage, I was I was pretty quick to respond to what he gave me. And I really was enamored with his approach at that time. So we had a good relationship. I think he really, uh, you know, took me a little bit under his wing and then he would showcase me to guys, which I hated because I didn't, I, I felt I didn't know what I was doing, but I would look back, I go movement wise. And in terms of presenting the technical approach, I saw, Oh, I did get that. You know, you, you, your head's in another place sometimes when you're thinking more about music and not just the technique. And that's was my biggest aspiration was to really formulate better musical skills, which I was working yeah. on diligently. But, you know, the technique thing kind of came, I, I don't want to say easy, but I did my work. I really put in my time to to get that stuff together. So he'd showcase me and it would really, you know, kind of freak me out. And later on, he did that all the time when I was hanging with him later in the 80s. But I just wanted wow. to throw back that yeah. with Freddie, with the the junk thing, junk thing and a, a escaping New York and coming out to Los Angeles. I think it was somewhere in the mid 60s, 66 or 67, the great vibist Terry Gibbs had a music store 
with a great drummer by the name of Mel Zelnick. And Mel Zelnick had done like some, you know, NBC orchestra stuff out here in Los Angeles. Also was a drummer with the Benny Goodman Sextet, if I'm not mistaken. Hmm. And they opened a store. And um, Freddie and Terry knew each other from the New York days. And and Freddie looked up to Terry quite a bit because I guess Terry was kind of a little bit older or just had that more of a father figure. And he he basically took Freddie in and said, look, it, clean yourself up and I'll give you a job teaching. So Freddie started teaching at the music stop. I think he had already had a little, you know, uh, maybe a few students earlier on. But I think that would be a marking point where he really started to hit stride. And he had a lot of guys that came around, like so guys like Mike Baird. I don't think Mike was an earlier student. Don Lombardi was an early student of Freddie's. Um, John Hernandez from Oingo Boingo. Yeah. Uh, Burley Drummond from Ambrosia. Um, There was a drummer that played with John Davidson by the name of Joey Herrick. And that was the talk of of my lessons when I came in because Joey was like this, you know, very successful guy with John Davidson. Hmm. And Freddie would always bring up, Joey, Joey Herrick, man. So... (laughs) But so <laughs> it's like but, the previous yeah. version of like he'd showcase him and then you took over. But I, I also want to say that like it, it it's interesting the the obvious you know the 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 drug problems and stuff. It's just it seems so like I don't want to say cinematic, but like that era of like the fifties and the jazz guys and you kind yes. of think maybe famously like Miles Davis or something. These guys getting mixed up with like heroin and and it's. Uh, it's terrible, but it seems so like common. Uh, you just think of jazz in the fifties and these, 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 you know, getting into drugs and it's such a problem and you're right. Him, you're him right. Getting pulled out of it. And I'll give you a job if you clean yourself up. I mean, yeah. good for him though, for, you know, I'm sure it wasn't overnight obviously, but for, for pulling himself, you know, out of that. And no, absolutely. And, and that's where he started to kind of get his thing together and, and sort of position himself in the LA area as a teacher of renown, you know, and by the time I got there, he had already established himself for those years before. And there were a great deal of people. I had several people who would tell me, Oh, you should, if you really want to get your, your skills together, you got to go to Freddie Gruber. Uh, one of those guys was Mel Zelnick from the music stop. And it's interesting because Mel did not like Freddie. I found later on because I actually worked at the music stop starting my teaching career. I always date my teaching career starting at 82 because that's when I took over at the music stop. But I was teaching a little bit before that. But And it's just ironic that that's where Freddie kind of started his uh, yeah, really. uh, teaching and I was at the music stop. But Fre- Mel would always say to me, yeah, if you want to get your, your stuff together, Mel had this like really gravelly voice and he'd say, if you want to get your stuff together, uh, go to Freddie Gruber. <laughs> uh, but as I was teaching for Mel, I found out that he was always bugged by Freddie and he didn't, you know, when Freddie was working there as a teacher, he was always yelling at him. So it was like one of those things where I guess Freddie's um, results and, and what he was doing were highly respected by Mel. But the way Freddie went about it in terms of his character was not looked upon so greatly. So like a, it seems like a strong personality, to say the least. Um, but I, I'd like to hear maybe while we're you know, in that 70s, 80s era, yes. like what your lessons like, first off. All right. So how would you describe the Freddie Gruber technique? Like, what is it? And then maybe a little bit about like you come in, you know, literally walking in the door to when you leave. Obviously, we know it would be super late and you'd be bringing in a, you know, a sandwich or a <laughs> or yes, bowl to him. Yes, yes. What was it like? You know what I mean? Like, were you on a drum set? Were you on a pad? Yeah, no, you were on his old Ludwig drum set. He had this cool old kind of, uh, you know, dark mahogany stained. Uh, actually, it was kind of like an oil finish. There was no lacquer on it. Uh, Ludwig drum set. Calf skins on the bass drum. Remo ambassadors on the toms. But everything had the old Remo uh, practice pads. And those are the metal ones, not the plastic ones with the little kind of ridge that yeah. sort of emulated a, a, a drum hoop. And then you would sit down, of course, the first thing he said was play for me. And, you know, you'd play in about, you know, 30 seconds or maybe a minute into it. He'd get, you know, get a fair evaluation of where you're coming from. It's not that difficult. I understand how that works in in my teaching as well. And then he would just tear tear you apart. He he would just, (laughs) oh, my God, Jesus Christ, man. You know, and he'd start just going, you're going to kill yourself or what the hell was that, you know? (laughs) And so, you know, he'd kind of bring you down. Well, I was 18 at the time, so 
bringing me down was probably not too difficult because at 18, you know, you don't maybe always have a lot of confidence and you get sure. in the presence of a guy that you're, you know, you've been told is like the guy to go to, you know, you're basically yeah. feeling pretty, pretty bruised. But anyway, so a lesson would entail my early lessons were because I lived in Woodland Hills and Freddie lived in Tarzana. That's about, I don't know, about a 12 minute drive. So he'd always say, you're in the neighborhood, man, you know. So he'd get me there on Mondays at, I think, noon. And he usually was coming in from somewhere uh, from the weekend because I'd show up sometimes at noon and he wasn't there. And then he'd drive in in his Firebird, kind of out of breath. Come on in, man. Open the door. <laughs> throw you in. Go, 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 go sit down on the drums. I'll be right there. And then he'd start to uh, pour himself a bowl of all brand and <laughs> slice up the bananas and sit with you. And so, you know, of course, scheduling wise, you're saying it's supposed to be an hour lesson. Well, most lessons were maybe 22 minutes, you know? Yeah. And that's just how we ran. And then in the middle of my lesson, there'd be this guy. Now, at that time, there was a guy, I can't think of his name. His name eludes me, but he was a show drummer and he would show up. He was in his 50s and he wanted to get better on the on the trap kit. He was mostly a percussionist for, for shows, you know, whatever shows were in town sure. yeah. in the Los Angeles area. And so he'd show up and I'd still be doing, and then Freddie would go, Hey, Hey, come on in here, man. I want you to watch the kid play, you know, and I do my thing. But so that was kind of my, my early studies that first year or so as my schedule started to change and I get those evening slots, that would be more like the lesson would be at seven. I'd show up at seven and there were three guys sitting on the couch and there was a guy uh, on the drum set. I, I was like tolerant of that. Many people weren't. I'll tell you who wasn't tolerant. My girlfriend at the time. She'd tell yeah. me. She'd say, she'd give me the riot act. This is this lady was a funny lady when I think back to that that period of my life. She'd go, you tell Freddie Gruber that your lesson's at 7 o'clock. And i go, I'm not telling <laughs> Freddie anything. I'm showing up for my lesson. And when it ends, it ends, you know? <laughs> so awesome. And that was, again, that would be the time where if I showed up at 7, he'd go like, I haven't eaten all day, man. Can you run? <laughs> and so for me... Because I was one of those guys who was very precise about stuff. Once he told me and gave me direction to do something or pick something up, there was no question. He'd, he'd, he'd go and uh, tell me, you know, like, okay, are you sure you got that? And I'd raise my eyebrow and go, like, Freddie, who are you talking to? You know? And so he knew that I was a dependable lad and would get the order right, you know? Yeah. So I'll tell, you, I'll tell you a funny story, though, about the brow beating. This was maybe, I don't know. So maybe a year and a half into it. And I was, you know, my brother had just started playing uh, guitar and was getting into the jazz guitar. So he had traded in his Les Paul for an ES-175. For those of you who don't know, that's a hollow body j guitar b jazz box, kind of like what Wes Montgomery and Pat Metheny and all those great guys would play. And so my brother was very determined he was going to be a composer. And, and, and do stuff. So we were starting to get, our, you know, kind of get our little groove together and do some stuff. And I was probably 19, maybe 20 at that point. And I was like, a, you know, nervous guy. I'm reading out like, yeah, you know, I really want to play with my brother. And I, 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 I want to, you know, I want to uh, uh, be a jazz guy and I want to get my stuff together and I want to record records. You know, I'm just like nervously chattering. Yeah. And Freddie's looking at me and he's like, just doesn't look like he's feeling well. And he didn't say anything, which was pe peculiar for Freddie. And there was nobody else there, which was very odd because this was uh, maybe a late afternoon lesson. And he looked over, he was sitting at his table, uh, breakfast table. He picked out like a little bottle of, of some medication. He opened it up, you know, just like took it, swallowed the water, put it down. And I'm still going on with my, and I want to, you know, I want <laughs> to do this huge. and I want to do that. And, and, uh, Freddie eventually picks up that bottle like a, maybe about a minute later and he looks at the, the label on it and his eyes bug out and he goes, Jesus Christ, man, you, you, you made me take the wrong medication. I don't Oh my God, I got to call the die. And he just started freaking out on me. Oh, boy. All right. So I'm, I'm losing. I'm going, oh, my God, I'm sorry. You know, I didn't know what I, you know, you know. And so this was one of those times where 
it must have been, I don't know, could have been for two months following. Every time somebody would come in when I was saying, this is the guy that almost killed me, you know? <laughs> oh, my God. So he that was sounds a, just, yeah. he sounds like a character. I mean, it's just a character. It's like. Absolutely. Freddie uh, was the most interesting guy. I, I lived with him. I traveled with him all through Europe when I lived over there. He came to visit me several trips where we did some clinics together, and I brought him around to the Frankfurt Music Fair. And we would stay in this little hotel outside of Frankfurt that uh, some my cousins in Germany had. And we'd make it our little home base. Or sometimes we'd go back to my apartment in Belgium and we would stay there for a few days before we were venturing out to somewhere else. And it was really challenging because Freddie was a handful to take care of. But at the same time, you know, there was some golden moments of... Being able to look back, because this was in the 90s, mind you. So when I look back and I was able to kind of get uh, uh, a little more distance from what I'd worked on, I'd have really, really pointed questions for him. Now, again, he was not always the best to answer. He'd get kind of cryptic. But when you had him up at like three in the morning, because Freddie was this night owl, he'd get very animated and he could give you some just kind of cryptic analogies. And you go, yeah, 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 yeah I, I, I think I got it. And then, you know, I kind of like work it out where I figured out exactly what he was talking to uh, or how he was laying it out to me, talking to me to kind of put it in a more conceptual base where I could go, okay, now I can articulate that a little bit better. That was the, hmm. the, the, the point where I really started to work on the narrative to how to teach and take the concepts that I had gotten from him. Not, I didn't just get stuff from Freddie. There's other people that played into my teaching role, but sure. it was really just fascinating to hang with him. I'll, I'll tell you just, here's another story. If we, cause we're talking Freddie, we want to yeah. do the, the Fred talk. So it's a Fred talk. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this is a, a long story, but I'll make it short. So again, around that same period of time, I was doing that same rap. I probably did that a few times. It probably drove Freddie nuts where I was like, ah, and I want to, I want to do this, you know, and try to, you know, state my goals. Yeah. And again, there was nobody there. And at one point, he just reached over to his um, phonograph player, pulled out a record, laid it down, put the stylus on the, the album, and it was uh, John Abercrombie's uh, Timeless record. So the first tune is real frenetic, and it's Jack DeJanette with Jan Hammer on B3 organ. And I'd never heard anything like that. It was like a wickedly fast tempo, like, you know, you know, just super fast. And I, I, I stopped because he put the record on, and I was just speechless. And maybe about two and a half minutes after listening to the record, he pulled the needle off and he looked at me. And, and I just remember I was dumbfounded by what he said. But he said, do you think those guys are trying to make money, man? <laughs> and I went, uh, I don't know. So, OK, fast forward. Here I am in 2006 at the Latvian, uh, the um, Sal Krusty Jazz Festival with my brother. And the featured act was John Abercrombie with Adam Newsbaum and Gary Versace. And my brother knows John loosely or knew him when he was alive. And I had met Adam a few times too, hung with him pretty extensively at Frankfurt a few years before. And David said, come on up. You want to talk and meet John and talk to Adam? And I said, I'm not sure if Adam will remember me. And as soon as I walked in, Adam's like big bear hug. Bruce, how you doing? Real friendly. I love, he's such a personable guy as well as a fantastic player. And John Abercrombie was sitting on the chair, just completely sunk in it, toasted from their travels. I guess they had a hard travel to get up to Latvia. Hmm. And so I told him that exact story. And at the end of that story, he looked up at me and he, and very seriously, he said, as a matter of fact, we were trying to make money. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I, a year later or so, I'm at the the NAM show. Now, these times in the 2000s, Freddie and I, I was, you know, I kind of pulled away from Freddie and it really bugged him. And it was uh, not the cleanest of breaks. And he was just pissed at me. So whenever I would go and visit, I'd bring my brother as a buffer. At the NAM show, you'd always see Freddie around because he'd be there. He you know, Of course, he'd get there like four in the afternoon or five right before it shuts down. And then they'd have to kick him out. But anyway, so I had his attention for a minute. And he was kind of, uh, you know, unnerved that I was talking to him. But I said, Freddie, I got to tell you a story. So I laid out the beginning story about when he put the record on for me. I told him the part about where I saw John Abercrombie. And when I hit that mark and said, and John said to me, 
Well, as a matter of fact, we were trying to make money. Freddie looked at me and went, oh, back to the coda, huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. So, so these, were the, these were the trials and tribulations of hanging with Freddie. But yeah. I, and again, I must say that we had some riotous laughing in Germany. I mean, and, and when I traveled with him. And as well, when I was at his house, I was the go-to guy. I was the guy who house sat for him. I was the only guy he left the key to open the drum room. He would not allow that room in that house. Wow. To, he had he had a door that was entering this little hallway where the bathroom was in two bedrooms. And that door had a lock and each bedroom door had a lock. Jeez. And whenever I would sit, house sit for him, which I did many times, I'd say, Freddie, I want the drum key uh, so I can go in and practice. And he'd go, ah, okay. You know, and he'd relent, but, but I know nobody ever got that privilege. You know, that was wow. like a, like an honor to, to have his trust. Again, like I said, he saw me as a very trustworthy lad who yeah. said, uh, as he would say, you say what you play and play what you say, Becker, you know, man, which speaks to your character, obviously. Cause I mean, everyone listening can tell you're a great guy, but when, when someone, I always think it's like, if you have a boss or something at work who just, you know, everyone's kind of like, he just whatever you do, just someone above you who, who isn't a nice person, not night, not that Freddie's not a nice person, but, and, and they respect you and they're nice to you. It feels better. You know what I mean? It goes further when you, you impress someone who's a tough, you know, critic of, of who's a little bit cynical of everything. When yeah, they like yes, you, it speaks yeah. to your character. Well, um, you know, and there were things like about Freddie that you knew that he just didn't do for other people. And again, reflecting back, I know that he had a high regard for me. So the, the, the breaking period was just as he got older, um, he didn't care so much. Uh, like his teaching career had slowly slipped away, but he had money. So it didn't really matter. He was well taken care of. Mm. And um, it seemed to me he was more in, in, involved in trying to just keep his legacy and being that, that eccentric character and kind of amplifying it so that it became even larger. Because anything that you would see or hear from people now, especially those last, you know, 11 or 12 years of his life from 99 to 2011, you'd go, oh yeah, like it was like, he was a, like a caricature of what he was, you know, hmm. and trying to, I think he had the line, as I recall, it's like, I don't care whether you love me or hate me. I want you to know who I am. Yeah. Was the kind of the line, so to speak. And, um, hmm. and that, that was, you know, that was good. I, I think that he had uh, 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 more things involved uh, in terms of what he could have brought forward. I, he lived his life how he wanted to. So I have no, you know, right to say anything regarding that. But, yeah. you know, as his teaching declined and I had moved back to LA, I found myself in his clutches for, you know, the wrong side of things. And I was looking after him quite a bit. And I realized that as his health started to, you know, not, it wasn't declining, but his choices were declining. So he wanted to get high again. Oh, wow. And I think nothing more was like, he just wanted me to kind of be like a high buddy with him. And uh, I saw, you know, uh, two devastating roads i could either be dead or in jail and yeah. i said i got to get out of here and you know it was not a pleasant leaving and uh when 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 i left he was mad at me for years i'd have to go over with my brother like i said earlier to make pilgrimage and i i just wanted to go freddie i just want to honor the 23 years or so that we hung because we had some great rip roaring times and it would take him a, all about it maybe an hour an hour and a half if we sat at the house before he would just kind of go to a relaxed posture and then be talking to me as if we talked the day before, you know, mm. the first thing would be we'd knock on the door and he'd see my brother and he'd go, David, and he'd give him a big hug. And then he'd look at me, raise his eyebrow, drop his glasses and go, Hey man. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. That's just, that's just so funny. He's was, such a character. Oh, he was amazing. I mean, in terms of that, I mean, I, I know there's other people have stories. I have so many stories of, of Freddie that I could go on for, you know, for forever. I, I, I should really try to chart them out. Here's a little of Freddie's character. When we were in Europe, it was very challenging for him because as you know, People, well, maybe you don't know, but people in the Netherlands and people in the Flemish part of Belgium, they all speak English pretty well, but they're not, it's not their native language. 
And the first trip that Freddie made to to visit me, which was funny, I moved in in May of ninety two. And Freddie was like freaking out that I was leaving. He was like, you don't really want to go, you know, and all this stuff. And <laughs> what I assessed after that was, no, you don't want me to go. Yeah. And he arranged a trip. Two months later, he was on my doorstep. Two months later. And he didn't like to travel and 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 lean upon anybody. But again, I guess my reliability was was a factor in him trusting me that he made four trips over there. And we hung quite extensively. Hmm. But he had a trip planned the first time he went there, and he was really agitated about the, the the cultural elements of things, and we were driving around quite a bit. We went down to Austria. We went to Germany. We were going to like, there was a school in Vienna that I eventually taught at that was sort of patterned after the uh, Musicians Institute, and um, there was a store in Frankfurt a pretty big drum shop, and we went there, and we met like uh, one of the drum magazine guys from the magazine Drums and Percussion. We went to the Netherlands and met the guy who at the time was with the Dutch magazine. We also met a, a teacher who was not too far from where I lived in Antwerp. And we just kind of made the rounds. And he was super agitated. And at one point in the evening of, I don't know, maybe the eighth day, we were hanging out and we got a mellow. Like we, we, we got some ha- hash up there in, in the Netherlands. <laughs> And we were smoking a little hash, and I put on Bill Evans' uh, explorations. And we were just hanging, and Freddie got really relaxed. And it was great, because I knew I could get Freddie sometimes into that zone. And uh, we were just chatting about music and hanging. And uh, at the end, like about 1 o'clock, I go, I got to go to bed, Freddie. So I showed him that there was a timer light on the hallway wall. You know, walk straight, there's the bathroom. And on the other side where the bathroom door is, on right outside that door, there's another light to put the timer light on. And so he went to the bathroom. This is probably maybe three in the morning. He walked out and he didn't turn that light on. And when you walked out that bathroom, you took three steps forward. There was a flight of stairs. Oh, my God. You were living over a bar. And those narrow stairs of of, of Belgium and, and the Netherlands, kind of those kind of steep and narrow. Eddie fell, man, right down the stairs. And so I heard this, bam, 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 bam. And I woke up and my brother and I were sharing a room. And I went, wow, what what, what the hell was that? And within one second, you hear this, Jesus Christ, man, <laughs> God damn it. And so my brother jumps out of bed, runs, flips the light on, looks at Freddy, he's at the bottom of the stairs, you know, kind of coiled up. Thankfully, all he did was dislocate his shoulder. Oh, man. And so it was just unbelievable. So I had to, uh, you know, his trip that he had planned to do some other things. He was going to go to the UK and go to London and hang with the guys from Ronnie Scott's because they they booked Buddy there all the time and he knew those guys. And so he had to go to the hospital. He's in the back of an ambulance. I didn't want to be with him because I was freaking out. So I was driving the rental car that we had and my brother was in the back of the ambulance with him and he was squeezing my brother's hand so tight and go, I don't want to die, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but all it was is was a dislocated shoulder. So yeah. we would bring him food because the hospital food was horrible. And at one point, he was telling us a story. He goes, that nurse, man, she doesn't know how to how to hit a vein at all, you know. So he's kind of talking up his heroin experiences. <laughs> and he said, I wanted to grab the needle out of her hand and jab it in my own thigh for myself. You know? Oh, my God. Wow. <laughs> So anyway, oh, those, those those were the those were the Freddy trials and tribulations. But again, when I look back, I, there's things that I think about that he imparted to me. One piece of wisdom that I hold to my daily what I want to say gratitude was he would all say, "Bruce, cover it up front, man." Now you can look mm-hmm. at that phrase, and you could have a lot of meaning to it, but it does envelop anything that you want to put forward. Whether it was think things through is what he would tell me really was by saying cover it up front, you know, know, know the, the whole range of what you're getting involved in. So you really think it through. Sometimes that's not necessarily the best advice because it's good to fly by the seat of your pants and take chances as well. You don't want to yeah. get too, you know, trapped by the thinking mode and remove yourself from that. Hey, I'm just going to go do this, you know, and sometimes that's what is what creativity is all about. I'm going to do this. And you just go with it, you know? 
So, but I still live by that uh, covered up front in every faction to to a varying degree. I do have a nice balance of being, you know, taking chances. I used to travel to Europe quite a bit, do a lot of workshops. I'd book them on my own. And my cover it up front was I had a little bank account over in Europe. I had several friends. <laughs> if anything yeah. ever fell through the floor, I'd have a nice three-week vacation in Europe. But thankfully, nothing ever happened like that. I always was able to, you know, work with the right people who honored their word and and made things happen. So Sure. Well, that's a great... Because before when you, when you were saying he would say sort of cryptic things, I was thinking, what does that mean? But saying cover it up front, I mean, that's... That's something where, like, I bet you'd be in multiple situations, and you just go, "Oh, that could be that too." It's, it's yes, like where, yes. I mean, what a man of he sounds very, very deep, but like in certain elements of his personality, it's a little bit more not so deep. More like, "Oh, that's Freddie. That's what you get." But, but he yeah, like yeah. He, you know, I you'd have to talk to you know. I mean, I had a, a, a great deal of of conversations with a few people, and I think they would would come to the same agreement. If if I've talked to Steve Smith before about it, and I think he would have somewhat of the same telling. Or if uh, you know, Peter Erskine told me about his story with trying to study with Freddie, and and Freddie said something to him that just clicked. You know, it was just like he did like a dance step at which Freddie had this certain dance step that he w- would always do. And it made sense to what Peter was seeking and searching. Hmm. And so it really opened up Peter's head to kind of validate what he was, where, where what path he was on and, and what he wanted from Freddie. Now for, for some guys that may have been again, like a, a cryptic or an elusive analogy, but for a bright insightful guy like Peter, it was very clear, you know, but he did have to chase. He, like everybody else had to chase down Freddie. You would think that, that, you know, that he would be a little different around those people. Like the guys that were like of, of higher status, like a Neil Peart. No, he was the same. Like Neil, after his, um, you know, tragedy with his wife and his daughter at that time, spent some time in that back room that I used to lay in uh, that room when, when I was house sitting for Freddie. Now, I didn't get a chance to meet Neil at that time. I was there at those periods. That That's when I was still hanging with Freddie. So, but, but I think Freddie would have honored uh, Neil's anonymity at that time and not want anybody to bug him. So he probably would have, um, you know, not said anything. Maybe I yeah. would have come over. He might not have said anybody's in the back room sleeping or anything like that. Or he might have just said like, no, no, not, not today, man. I'm, I'm busy. Yeah, that's... um. Neil's situation was obviously so tragic where in, in a short period of time, he lost his wife. So people know, obviously he lost yes. his wife and his daughter. And then yeah, within just, a I mean, year, within a year. Yeah. Unbelievable. But yeah, that's all right. So that's a uh, perfect transition to talk a little bit about Freddie Gruber as this teacher of guys like obviously you, but you know, y- you were a long, long, long time teacher friend, like his number one guy, but I'm talking like Vinny. Neil, Steve Smith, Dave Weckl, as you said, Peter Erskine. Okay. Like, well, I was, did he- I was there for two of Steve Smith's lessons, but here's okay. how it would play. I would show up and Freddie would go, sit down and play. So one of the things, and it took me, I, I think it was after the time that I played for Dave Weckl, and it was probably 94. And I didn't want to go over to play for Dave. I was like, I had flown in from Europe. I was still living over there. And I called Freddie up. Or maybe he called me and he said, Bruce, what are you doing? And I said, I'm jet lagging. I'm just about to go to sleep. He goes, no, 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 no. I want you to come over. David's here. Okay, <laughs> David. So I like, who the hell is David? And Freddie Riley responding, Weckle, who do you think? And I'm like, well, how do I know? Dave, I never heard yeah. of David. He's Dave as far as I know. So Freddie badgered me. And I, I relented. I went down there and I'm driving down Ventura Boulevard and I'm thinking like, what the hell am I going to play for this guy? So when I sat down and played, you know, I just did my thing and my loose jazz b- between the halftime shuffle and kind of swinging and playing some figures. And Dave was very kind and very, you know, friendly about, hey, man, sounds great and blah, blah, blah. And we had a nice little chat and we kind of hung and we were like all sitting there for a minute. And then Freddie would go, all right, man, uh, you know, kind of leave. <laughs> And so funny. you didn't get a chance to hear the phraseology that Freddie would use to color the imaginative Dave and exactly what he was doing. I, I can understand bits and pieces of what he, what he did with Dave just by watching Dave play, but I've never had in-depth conversations. Same with Steve. I, I, I was there for two lessons with Steve Smith. 
at the same rundown. But there were many other guys I watched him teach. So that period of time between uh, post-student, well, you know, I watched him because you'd be sitting there anyway sometimes uh, back at the old house. But when he moved into the other house that he that he remained in until he passed, um, I was there as uh, sometimes like the caretaker looking over Freddie because I'd call him up and I'd have, you know, time off when I wasn't on the road. And he'd go, what are you doing? I said, nothing. He goes, come on over. I said, what are you doing? Freddie goes, I'm working. Come on over. So I'd hang and I'd watch him teach like about five guys. I'd sit on the floor. And at that time in the 90s, his presentation had broken away from any books. When I studied with him in the 70s, he was very meticulous about using literature from the Buddy Rich book, hmm. from the Roy Burns, Lou Mallon book, Finger Control, uh, from Ted Reed, Syncopation. There was a little cool rock book that we worked from that was, you know, again, he rewrote everything I say. In other words, he would supply the conceptual approach to, as to how we were going to go through that. Um, and this one little rock book, it was like, I don't know, it's like a 10-page book. It's called 72 Modern Rock and Roll, Bo uh, rock and Roll Patterns, and it doesn't exist anymore. But he broke it down, and we'd, we'd, we'd implement the bass drum technique that we were involved in. We'd implement the, the approach to the cymbal, whether it was the push-pull or whether it was like laying out like in a more molar thing, which he didn't call it molar. I later found out through Dom Famularo that Freddie had studied with Joe Morello. And I did know this via Jimmy Chapin that Freddie had studied with Jimmy. So mm -hmm. going back to my earlier statement about Freddie being a master observer of people and what they do, I think he was an excellent guy who collected data and was able to put it into his fold. Now, mind you, he didn't really intimate where he got the stuff. So like for the push-pull technique, he called it the system. I never asked him, why the hell did you call it the system? I didn't, I didn't think to that. He didn't call it molar. He just called it the whip snap motion. Hmm. And so we would implement those and, you know, go through, oh man, so much material. I have, you know, like a pretty big stack of books that I went through. And um, when I was watching him teach as the 80s rolled on into the 90s, it became less. By the time the 90s rolled around, there was like no books. It was more posture gesturing, getting guys to do certain things and conceptual stuff. And many guys, I don't say many, but there's guys who studied at that period of time who had come to me. One notable was Daniel Glass. Daniel, yeah. I, I remember him like just perplexed, like, well, I don't really get what, what, what he was saying. And so Danny studied with me a little bit at that time in the late 90s when I was still hanging with Freddie. And then Around 2006 or seven, Daniel studied with me for a good couple of years or so, and I was able to really kind of expound on a lot of stuff. And, and expound, I say, you know, my interpretations are brought from playing music and from um, as well as, you know, doing sessions and stuff like that. So I was able to bring those things into a more real world framework for people. But in, in those 90s periods, like, you know, I remember being there for a lesson for Tristan Bowden, uh, Steve Houghton. Um, a young Joey Warnaker was there on those wow. afternoons when I was there back when I wasn't studying. So back in the like mid to late eighties. And again, his approach was a little book oriented, but less book oriented. And mm. it was hard to assess because I can't remember the details. I do remember certain details. There was this one crazy drummer who was like really ultimately talented in any kind of polyrhythmic playing. You know, it was just super in his vernacular to just pull that stuff out. And he was a wacky kid, but he played. You just go, my God, this guy's ridiculous in what he can do. He just didn't have a, a user-friendly personality to get into a work mode. And I know that in that specific situation, Freddie had him going through what I went through as well was this Nick Ciroli book. It was called uh, Independence Volume 1. But Freddie had, again, a very unique way of doing stuff. So any literature that you would see from Freddie would always have a very pointed interpretation as to what you were to do. And so it would match your needs as he would say, okay, you need to work on this, take this book and, and work through this obviously, but yes, so, essentially. Yeah. yeah. There was some, there was always a personalized element to it. So things could look similar to other guys. Like, cause I had a, uh, recently in the last, I haven't seen him now, maybe about a year and a year or so in terms of studying with me. But a guy who came a little bit after me, about maybe eight or 10 months after me, was this guy, David Bronson. And David played with the 
Righteous Brothers for uh, 20 something years. And cool. now he's now he's the product manager for Istanbul Mehmet. And David came to me because he studied with Freddie for a short period of time, maybe about a year, a year and a half. And I got to commend David. He was the guy who stayed with Freddie in the last days of Freddie's life, which probably was no picnic and not an easy thing to do. And David's a very tolerant, but also very, uh, uh, let's say, stands in his own shoes, is not going to waffle. So like if Freddie would give him any grief, David would just go, all right, Freddie, I'll just leave then, you know, or whatever. But anyway, Bronson came to me to get some clarity on some of the things that we had worked on. And so, you know, going through what he had in his books was very similar to me. But again, there was a personalization to kind of help build and formulate your musical direction with what you want to do. It's exactly how I would uh, keep my ears peeled to what my students are about. You know, I've been very blessed to have some guys like David Garibaldi and Tristan Bowden is a student of mine and uh, Brian Head, who played with um, Roger Hodgson or plays with still. I, of course, nobody's doing any gigs. Uh, many guys. I got that the guy who plays with um, uh, Semisonic, Jake, Jake Slichter is a student of mine. Yeah. Gabe Ford, who played with Little Feet for many years. Um, mm. Daniel Glass, like I said, I had Clayton Cameron come out. I've, oh, I will just say this: I've given uh, some tutel- tutelage or just some conceptual conversation with JoJo Mayer about his lessons with Freddie to break down some foot stuff, you know. So that I'd say more of a consultation. But wow, you know, it's it's just, and you're carrying it on though, where like um, where these, I mean, everyone you're naming, yourself included, you, like you guys are all this whole group is like mega drummers let's be real they're famous top level drummers and it's just like this super cool thing that a lot of times maybe non-drummers or younger earlier on drummers don't really realize that the learning and the education never stops and i think obviously with freddie like and and it it probably translates onto you and i think now it's more common where people um just i don't know it's easier to find a good teacher such as yourself but where did people get this? Did did word of mouth about Freddie oh, yeah. spread? Is that how these, you know, super drummers would find him is just through word of mouth? Yeah. I mean, another another guy that I heard Freddie's name from was actually my my parents back in the mid 70s were involved in the dog show circuit. They were showing Alaskan Malamutes. And there was a guy who was a regular fixture at I think mostly the Southern California um shows who was a photographer and he was a drummer. His name was Eddie Rubin. He had played with um, Neil Diamond in the, in the early portion of Neil's career, I think in the late sixties. And um, my mother was, you know, always talking about her sons. Now I, I've done this imp- imitation of my mom before, but it's not my mom. My mom's Dutch. So she's got a thick Dutch accent, but she would say, Oh, my boys, they play drum. My one son plays guitar and the other plays drums. And Eddie Rubin would say, Oh, you got your son should study with Freddie Gruber. So I heard that from my mother. Mm. Again, um, I heard it from Mel Zelnick before I studied with Freddie. And um, my friend Mark Shulman and I were talking about that at the time, because that's about the period of time that Mark and I became more friendly with one another. He was a little bit younger and he was a, a young, talented whippersnapper. <laughs> and um, I was a little bit hot headed, like, who's this young kid, you know? But as we grew up, just in those high school years, I became a little more friendly with him. And he was saying, yeah, there's this guy, Freddie Gruber, but you don't want to bother with him. You should go to this guy who was a student. And this guy was this guy by the name of Rich Sandak, who I studied with a little bit as a a pre-Freddie insight as to what Freddie did. And Rich did a great job. I I liked the way he taught. And I, I think I studied with Rich for very short time because as I recall, and this might, this is validated by, by my brother, David. I called up Freddie, and the first time I spoke to him on the phone, he was, you know, running you through the mill. So, okay, how old are you? And I said, well, I'm 18. He goes, I really don't teach kids. Uh, who are you working with? And I said, who am, who am I working with? I'm a kid in school, you know? Yeah. And, well, I don't know. I'm really booked up. I mean, maybe call me next week. So what he was doing was just kind of gather, gathering, are you going to be serious and follow through? And so... Because he was so, you know, kind of running me through the mill, I got agitated and I just said, all right, man, well, whatever, I'll, I'll call you back a later date, you know. And so once I went through this series of lessons with Rich and I felt like, oh, I, I get this whole thing. All right, cool. 
my brother alleges. Now, I don't remember this specifically, but he was there. I, he said, I picked up the phone and Freddie answered. And I said, Freddie, this is Bruce Becker. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, Man, it's like karate or something. Yeah, like that. yeah, exactly. Wow. Exactly. So, you know, going back to the, the, the whole, you know, the whole stream of consciousness here. Freddie was an interesting dude. He had some some really great insights. I, I know that there's a lot of people that out there in the drum community didn't really get what, what he was about, and it's very um, elusive as to what information is out there. Um, those who who were around him would be able to attest to what he was able to do. I think you know he's definitely somebody that that was a a, a great uh, observer and, and a great assistance to a great deal of people. I mean, when you watch Dave Weckl play. You can you can just see the 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 great change how Dave evolved his post Freddie studies. He's so fluid and just so demonstrative of the essence of what that's all about. And so you have no greater um, what he would say, like signpost of what what Freddie was capable of. You know, now we can't dismiss Dave's tenacity. Dave is a hardworking guy who's super intelligent, bright, and insightful. And has you know very concrete goals that he's achieved. So the 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 bonding between the two really put it up to a level where you go like, yeah, <laughs> there it there it yeah, is. You know, as well as Steve Smith. I mean, watch Steve Smith from 1985, and then his studies would have been, oh, I think 90, 91, somewhere mm-hmm. around that period, 89, 90, 91. And again, you go. Look at look at the amount of fluidity that Steve Smith has achieved. I mean, it's just it's again it it speaks volumes to what Freddie was capable of. There's many guys that we that maybe people don't know about. For example, Burley Drummond from Ambrosia, or Mike Baird, you know, who was a session guy, who also was the follow up drummer to Steve Smith and Journey for for a period of time. Uh, did those uh, classic Billy Idol cuts. Um, who else? Uh, John Hernandez from Mungo Boingo. I, I mentioned these names earlier, but you know yeah. these guys. Th- those guys had very poignant careers and did stuff that was great contributions to the music world. And uh, they were all, you know, uh, kind of led in there and 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 facilitated, or, or Freddie helped facilitate what their goals were and uh, helped to achieve that. Yeah, it sounds like a club almost um, of guys, like a fraternity almost, where like. You know, and and I get that where and and Steve Fiddick was on the on the show and um, talked about his lessons with Joe Morello, and it would be a thing where again where like and I've said this with other you know examples of teachers who are a little bit um, their own person where where you you either like it or you hate it. You either say I'm okay to wait three hours or go do your you do your errands, which it was very similar with uh, Joe, but. Um, all right, now let me ask you because I'm sure you know, like you said, there's many many drummers he's he's taught, but. We we is there any other Neil Peart information? Because I just think that's such an iconic thing where it put Freddie. I know he was already on the map, but I'm talking about like you know household yeah, name, right? Right. Because the th- the cool thing what Neil did was he really kind of you know took his platform and kind of led Freddie into that platform to be introduced to a myriad of people who would probably never know who Freddie Gruber was. Yeah, and. Outside of that, I really don't know because, again, like at that period of time, so Neil would have been studying more in that earlier 90s period. So somewhere about that Buddy Rich tribute before mm-hmm. his his uh, tragedy with his wife and his and his daughter. Yeah. And so I was in Europe. So I, unfortunately, like I said, I never got a chance to meet Neil. I was a huge fan. I was uh, very lucky to have just just tripped into Rush by the fact that I went to a concert December 1st, 1976 and rush was the opening act for Ted oh, Nugent. Cool. And they were traveling on the, all the world's a stage record. And my brother and I were already playing in our rock trio. You know, that was our idea. We wanted to be a power trio. And I saw these guys and my, my jaw hit the floor and I went, Oh my God, this is amazing. And so I was Insta fan and I followed pretty steadily up until moving pictures. I would listen to the hits that followed the radio hits yeah. and I loved the tunes, you know, so whether it was, you know, time stand still or whatever, 
like I've, I listen to those. I, in fact, my kids that my, I have two very young kids. I have a four and a half or well, soon to be five-year-old boy and an, uh, soon to be eight-year-old daughter. But I would go through, especially when Neil passed away, you know, roughly a little bit more than a year ago, I went through a whole, as I'm sure everybody did, a whole, you know, revamping of the stuff that I knew. And then also going back and listening to things I didn't know. Hmm. But I wish I knew more about the relationship with Neil and, um, and Freddie. I just know that he was very respectful of Freddie's teachings. Yeah. He had a high regard and he had a platform where he was able to bring Freddie and allow Freddie to step forward, even as cryptic and kind of nutty as Freddie is. Yeah. And um, that was probably one of the greater attributes of what, you know, Freddie was able to kind of fall into again, just for the, for the recognition or the world stage platform that Neil brought to him. Yeah. And from what I've seen and heard that it, uh, Neil, I believe really, talked a lot about that that fluidity like you mentioned that Freddie could bring to him and the motion and the traditional uh-huh. grip yeah. and yeah. you know it's a different world than the Prague um you know rush world but all right so as we're getting close to the end here and this has just like been unbelievable to get these first hand experiences and we almost it's like <laughs> the voice the voice of Freddie that you get to use almost well, as well, a uh, a I've, Sammy Davis Jr. hint to it. <laughs> well, well, I've been told I was once in Frankfurt at a uh, dinner with Don Lombardi and Freddie. And many people may not know this, but Freddie was a part owner in DW for many years. Hmm. And Freddie always had this funny attitude against Don. So we were the three of us and Freddie was there. And I looked at Don and I did like one of my Freddie impressions. And Don like looked at me bright eyed. He goes, that's the best Freddy I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. So we're getting the real deal. Uh, ah, pretty <laughs> close. I can channel a lot. I don't do it as often, but since we're on the the mode of Fred talk, it seems quite appropriate to bring that to light and kind of, you know, give Freddie his due and give the tribute to him as what we're putting together here today. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's so cool. All right. So as we get close to the end here, let's, um, well, first off, let's give a big shout out to your student, longtime listener of the show who has just been such a nice guy to me, uh, Steve Hatfield, who recommended you for this episode and really, thank God, stuck on me to um, get it together. Because That's awesome. I should, I should say to people that if you suggest an episode, I always write them down, or at least in the last year, I, I've gotten better about it. I always write them down. Some of them take a long time to get to, but I have them all um, written down. But thank you to Steve. Um, yes, Steve. Steve's a great dude. Yep. Yeah. Well, on that note, wh- where can people find you? Lessons, all that stuff. Are you giving online lessons? Let's talk about you yes. for a little bit yeah. as we close yeah. out here. I'm uh, I'm available online. Um, I'm I'm you know I have a healthy schedule. Thankfully, so with all the COVID, my my lane of playing had slowly diminished over the last six years or so, just by the landscape of who I was working with, and as my teaching started to really get larger, and I have uh two two people to thank one would be drum channel they they sort of brought me up there for a couple of years and that started it and then when i went to drumio it went off the hook so a big thanks to to jared falk and and dave atkinson and all the people up at drumio but i'm available uh brucebecker.com is my website you can follow me on facebook i think it's bruce becker drums and i think on instagram it's bruce becker drums and i think on youtube it's bruce becker drums pretty easy and I'm yeah. not a guy who's a you know social media nut because it's it's very challenging. I'm teaching every day pretty extensively, and uh, so it's it's hard to kind of keep up with that. But I do post some stuff. If you go to my YouTube channel and subscribe, you'll see some really great nuggets. I just don't want to be too redundant. Sure. Although there is redundancy in what we all do. Yeah. And so those are the ways to get a hold of me. And if you're really serious about you know, I have a very detailed, comprehensive way of breaking things up and making it into digestible bits. And again, that was brought forward by all my cryptic, uh, trying to really build into what Freddie was really putting forward, coupled with my my teaching experiences were, uh, a lot of them were, you know, back in Europe when I did clinics to people who did not speak English as a first language. So there you have to be very careful, careful how you describe and put things forward. So, but so if you're serious and you want to, if you want to change your game, that's what I do. I do it day in and day out. This this is technically my 39th year, as I said, dating back to my 1982 start at the Music Stop. But I've been teaching a little longer than that. So you got 40 years of 
of wow. teaching experience and insights that that are that are you know well crafted now the the verbalization of it is super simple to me i see it like very easy little micro steps to get changes in everybody's playing that's awesome and and as you know as uh, everyone knows you're never too old or too experienced or too young or anything to be no. taking lessons. A, a um, great a great deal of my students are in their 50s and 60s. Like I said, I had David Garibaldi for a little over two years. He's in his 70s. Uh, Tristan Bowden is now, I think he'll be 70 coming this year. Hmm. Uh, and then several guys who are just, you know, guys who are out working a day job, but they love to play and they get out there and gig on the weekend and they're all talented guys. You know, they're just really looking at building up their game and you know i have numerous guys we could talk to that would give you the you know the the uh what do you want to say the endorsement and go like yeah man this has been great so i just yeah you know work real hard i'm i'm not one who sits idly by i try to bring my a game every single time i show up and i have like i said progressive steps to make changes that's awesome so that's bruce B-E-C-K-E-R, BruceBecker.com. And um, obviously you can tell by listening that uh, Bruce is a nice guy and we'll, um, we'll take care of you. So Bruce, oh, and let me tell people that Bruce is kind enough to hang out for, you know, another 10 or 15 minutes or so. And I think maybe we just talk about some more Freddy stories and some, uh, some fun more info about your, your younger days and, and some, some stuff about the lessons. So sure. Um, if you want more info um, and another little, you know, short episode with Bruce, um, it is a Patreon bonus episode. So you can go to drumhistorypodcast.com and there's a Patreon button or I think it's patreon.com slash drumhistorypodcast, whatever works for you. Um, so on that note, Bruce, thanks so much for being on the show and we will talk shortly for the bonus episode. Thank you very much, Bart. And thank you for your contributions to the drum community. And it was a pleasure to speak with you about Freddie Gruber. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning.